Okay. Okay. So it's just fifteen. Maybe uh, yeah, we should start, right? Okay. And so you'll introduce me, then I will share my screen. Sure, sure, sure. That's how it will work. Okay. <coughs> so good morning to everyone, and good afternoon to Professor Hall. And I am uh, Alok Kumar Pan again, and I shall be the moderator of this session. And it is our great pleasure, truly great pleasure, to have Professor Hall with us today. I think that Professor Hall again needs no introduction to the Fiji and the community. I mean, the quantum information theory and quantum foundation community, because yes, he is, he is quite well known and he is very popular in among us. He did his PhD in theoretical physics in 1989 from Australia National University, and after that he did couple of postdocs and then he took break for 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 couple of years. And then he joined the Australian Patent Office, where we worked for 16 years, but kept publishing a couple of papers in every, every year. <clears throat> but when this Australian government uh, wanted to uh, do something in quantum information theory, he joined uh, Professor Weissman at the Brisbane, the Griffith University. He is currently associated with the Australian National Academy of Science. <clears throat> he has published around 120 research articles in high impact factor journals. And I should say that there are a few in physics community who has such a large spectrum of research topics. Besides his many pioneering contribution uh, in, uh, to the quantum foundation and quantum information theory, you will be surprised to know that he has written a book on general relativity and black holes. <clears throat> in fact, uh, I, along with the many Indians uh, and fellow Indians here, feel that Professor Hall is among the very few individuals who has such who have such a pinpointed understanding on quantum foundation and quantum information theory. And of course, as a person, I believe that he's one of the great human beings I have ever met because I, I cannot forget his kind gesture when he visited the uh, uh, partner in, in, in a conference in, that I arranged in 2015. So today we got the opportunity to listen to him and he will be talking about the causality, retrocausality and free will in Bell scenario. And this is a very important topic, and I request students to listen carefully and ask questions in the chat box. With this, uh, I would like to invite Professor Hall to present his uh, talk. Thank you. Thank you very much, Aylok. That's a very kind introduction, and I must say it's lovely to see you. Uh, Thank you. After meeting you. you. Yeah, I can see your um, um, the screen. Slide. Good. Yes. Uh, please make the okay. full screen. Righto. Okay. Let me do that. Oops. Sorry, it's just the, the computer's acting a little slow. Uh, no problem. Here we go. Right. Yeah. You lost your computer once in Europe. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, can we see the screen? Yeah, uh, move on to slides. Let's see if it's working. Okay, yep. Yeah, yep. it's working. Fine. Okay. Excellent. Okay, so yeah, thanks again for that introduction. I'm talking from Canberra, Australia, where it's very cold currently. And the work that I'll talk about was done with Cyril Bronciard, who's in a nice warm place in, in France. And uh, he'll be talking, I believe, to the summer school on Thursday. So keep an eye out for that. Uh, I've been asked to pitch the talk at the level of people who have perhaps just finished their undergraduate degree or in their last year or perhaps starting their PhD. So I'll try not to be too technical and uh, and just focus on the concepts mainly. Uh, and the organisers of the, of the summer school thought that these topics would be sort of fun topics for you to hear about. So let's, let's get into it. So in the outline... Uh, I'll first talk about our Bell non-locality, which probably many of you have heard of, but I'll explain what it is anyway, and uh, why it's of interest, not just on fundamental grounds, but because it can let us do things. It gives the promise of completely secure quantum cryptography, for example. But that promise is based on certain assumptions. You have to make some assumptions and then things are perfectly secure. So I want to look carefully at what those are and, uh, and, and argue that in practical terms, uh, it's not too difficult to subvert one of those assumptions and to cheat at quantum cryptography. 
And a nice surprise that came out of this research was that uh, th there turns out to be an important distinction between uh, causality and retrocausality that, that was unexpected. And then I'll give some conclusions at the end. All right, so we can start at the very basic with something I'm sure you're all familiar with, or you would not be at this summer school, and that's uh, quantum entanglement. And I'm particularly thinking of spatial entanglement. So we have uh, two or more separated systems. We could imagine just this left-hand branch here where there's a particle of one type here in Canberra and a particle, uh, no particles of that type in Calcutta. We could imagine another state where the situations are reversed, no particles of that type in Canberra, one in Calcutta, Kolkata. And, but quantum mechanics says, well, you can have a superposition of those two situations. And that's where the strangeness of quantum uh, correlations is generated from. A and you get a number of strange effects. We know from the Heisenberg uncertainty principle, we can't measure a quantum system with a single measurement. We can't find out its state. We find out one property, we disturb other properties. But yet, nonetheless, by using entanglement, there's a way to teleport an unknown quantum state uh, so that we can reproduce that state at a far distant location without knowing what it is, using an entangled system as a resource. There's a thing called dense coding, which I won't try and explain, but here entanglement allows you to put in more information than you would think possible into it, to store in quantum systems. And certainly there's the promise of quantum computing such as the very fast factoriz factorization of large prime numbers. And Shaw's algorithm, the first such algorithm for this, uh, re relies on entangled, entangled qubit pairs. But the sort of uh, entanglement that I'm interested in for this talk is called Bell non-locality. And it's a property for, of uh, very strongly entangled systems. It's of great fundamental interest because it rules out what are called local hidden variable explanations of what's going on in quantum mechanics. Uh, cl they're classical type explanations. It says they're impossible. Uh, and that was in the 60s when Bell uh, discovered this property. But uh, since the 90s, roughly, it's been realized it's not just of fundamental interest. Bell non-locality is actually a very useful resource. Uh, it can be used for this secure quantum cryptography, as I mentioned. It can also be used uh, to produce random numbers that are guaranteed to be random uh, by, by the laws of physics. That's, that's the selling point. Okay. Right, so to talk about Bell non-locality, I need to talk about what these hidden variable models are. And so I'll take this fairly, fairly slowly. Uh, we have a source that's producing pairs of physical systems. And throughout this talk, Probably the simplest physical system to have in mind is pairs of photons, one going each way, and they're correlated in polarization. But they could be any sort of physical system. You press a button on the source, it generates a pair of physical systems, and uh, one travels to this apparatus belonging to Alice, and Alice chooses to measure some property of her system. If she's measuring polarization, she may choose a, uh, a, a direction a favoured direction, uh, an angle of polarisation. If she's measuring, she might choose to measure position or momentum if it's a particle that the source is emitting. But whatever, she has a, she chooses a measurement, that measurement's labelled by X, X, and X could stand for various physical properties. She makes a choice. And then that's input. The system emitted by the source is input, and out comes a measurement result, which is going to be labelled by A. So very simple. The other physical system emitted by the source comes to Bob. And Bob, again, makes a choice of measurement setting, which we'll label by Y, and he gets a measurement result, which we label by B. Then because they're experimentalists, they say, hey, let's, let's do this. Let's, let's make lots of measurements and collect some statistics. So they vary their settings. They get, choose different measurement choices, X and Y. And for each pair of measurement choices, they run the experiment many times and get out the joint statistics of the measurement outcomes. They've now got a set of correlations which they want to explain. And, of course, if I'm talking about entangled photon pairs, you'd say, well, let's explain it with quantum mechanics. Sure. But what, what's of interest here is quantum mechanics may one day go out the window 
at least partially. For example, if we try and include quantum gravity. So we want to, we want to consider more general models that might explain these correlations. And the generic way to do that is first to start with a little bit of probability theory. So we say, suppose there's more information about this system that we, we don't know at the moment. In practice, it might be, say, the wave function or the quantum state of, of the particles emitted by the source. So there's some extra information, and we'll just, we'll just label that by lambda. That's the traditional label. It's a hidden variable, if you like. Uh, and it could be a quantum state. It could be other things. It might be a set of parameters. So probability theory says, well, if you've got some more information, the way it feeds into the correlations that you've measured is like this. Uh, for a given value of that parameter, uh, you have a joint probability that's predicted for those two measurement settings. And, and you multiply that by what the probability that, that lambda has that value for those measurement settings. So at the moment, we have nothing. We've just, we've just used classical probability theory, but that's how we incorporate this extra information. So if we want to do some physics, uh, Alice and Bob have kindly done the experimental physics and good on them. If we want to do some theoretical physics, we want to know what's, what is physically reasonable uh, to assume in any model of, of this hidden parameter. What properties should this joint probability have? What properties should this probability circled in red have? Are there natural restrictions? And this is what leads us to the idea of Bell locality and Bell non-locality. So on this slide, I've repeated these quantities up here. We want to know something about these. And there's three assumptions I want to discuss. There were other possible assumptions. But these are the important ones for now. Two of them relate to this joint probability, probability of the outcomes conditioned on this extra information. The first of those is determinism. And it's just it may be reasonable to assume, like in Newtonian physics, that in fact, a, a complete model of the universe, of the physics. Uh, if you know lambda, you actually know what the outcomes are. Certain outcomes are possible with probability one, they're guaranteed to occur if you know lambda and the settings, and all other possibilities don't happen. So uh, that's determinism. Let's, let's, let's consider that assumption. Another assumption, which we could consider quite independently, is to say, well, Alice and Bob make those measurements. And Alice, she gets statistics on her side for a given choice of her setting, for a given choice of Bob's setting and this variable. And if we want physics to be local, we don't expect that what happens at Alice's apparatus to depend on what Bob chooses for his setting, particularly if, for example, Bob is separated at such a large distance, makes his measurement choice Y oops, at the very last moment, uh, then light can't travel over to Alice's apparatus in time to uh, affect her probability distribution of her outcomes. So we make a locality assumption. Uh, we give this a neutral name as well, parameter independence, but uh, I'll call it locality for here. And we assume the same thing, that Bob's probability of getting a certain outcome for a given value of his apparatus doesn't depend on Alice's setting. Okay. So they relate to this. There are two assumptions we can make for this quantity. You can argue whether they're good or bad assumptions, but they're reasonable ones to consider. And they're important in quantum cryptography. The other assumption that's generally made is motivated by the idea that Alice and Bob can choose their me two measurement settings with perfect free will. That's where the idea of free will comes in. So if, uh, in particular, if they've got free will and they're genuinely Choosing, choosing the result based on nothing at all, except they feel like it, then there should be no correlation. This hidden variable can't depend on, on, on what values they chose and vice versa. So this, the way to say there's no correlation, uh, so I'll call that free will sometimes, the more neutral name is measurement independence, because free will is just a motivation for this mathematical property. And we can write it in several ways. Uh, the settings uh, don't depend on the hidden variable, they're free from that. It's also called free choice. Or if you take the joint probability of having given settings and a given value of the variable, it factorizes, no correlation between them. And that's equivalent using classical probability theory to this, which is what feeds in DDA. Okay, so this probability is only a function of lambda. 
if you put all three assumptions together, you get something called Bell locality. Uh, and Bell talked explicitly about the first two assumptions in his paper in 1964 and implicitly uh, made this assumption and, and then talked about it in later papers. Okay. Now, the interesting thing, of course, is quantum mechanics doesn't satisfy the combination of those assumptions. And again, I, I, I know a lot of you will have seen this, but some of you may be fairly new, so I'll remind you what it's all about. So we first consider the case that Alice and Bob are only going to choose between two possible settings. If they've got, if they're measuring polarizations of photons, they might use one angle, which they'll call zero, and another angle they'll call one. So there's two values of their settings they choose between. Oops. <laughs> and there's uh, two values for Bob to choose between two other polarization angles, for example. And their outcomes are going to be labeled by plus or minus one. For example, if they're measuring polarizations, uh, it goes through the polarizer, that's a plus one. Doesn't go through the polarizer, that's a minus one. If they were, say, measuring position and momentum, plus one might be the position is to the right of the origin and, uh, and minus one, it's to the left of the origin uh, if they were measuring particles rather than photons. Okay, so that, that's the special case we're going to consider the experiment that they do. Then there's this lovely condition. This one wasn't found by Bell, but later on by Clauser, Horn, Schumann, and Holt. Uh, can you explain the correlations that they get, the joint probability distribution, using a model satisfying those three, three assumptions, determinism, locality, free will, if you like? And it turns out that there are, for, for that to be the case, uh, this quantity S has to be smaller than two. And, and what is this quantity? Let's look at the first term. If, if Alice makes the choice to measure it, the x equals zero setting and Bob makes the y equals zero setting, then uh, and they take the average of the product of their results over many runs, they'll get a number, an average value. Similarly, if Alice chooses x equals zero and Bob chooses y equals one when they make their measurements, they can calculate this average of the product. Similarly, x equals one, y equals zero. And the only funny thing here is for x equals one, y equals one that you subtract the average. So you get a number this way. It's very, very easy to prove, uh, trivial in fact, uh, that if you make these three assumptions, this average has to be no greater than two. And then the amazing thing is that quantum mechanics says, wow, there are some systems, since quantum mechanics, it predicts with SQ as, as large as two root two. So here's this thing that we saw before by accident. So it can be 2.8 roughly, as big as that, 40% bigger. And there have been many experiments over the years. And about five years ago, there were three experiments that closed just about all possible loopholes. So we can, in fact, say not only is quantum mechanics L non-local, so is nature, because you do the experiments. And the derivation of this inequality doesn't assume quantum mechanics is true. It just says if you've got those correlations and, and, they, and this turns out to be greater than two, which is what they've measured, then uh, there, there is no model of the correlations that satisfy all three of those assumptions. So we have to give up one of them. And, and so then it's natural to ask, which assumption should we give up? Or should we give up more than one? Does it, and, but also, does it really matter? And you know, is this just philosophy or is there some interesting physics here? So uh, I, I hope to convince you, well, it does matter for some practical purposes, and there is some interesting physics. I, I should say that if, if one is committed to, to standard quantum mechanics, the assumption that you relax is determinism. If you have an entangled state, then the outcomes are not predetermined by the wave function, which is your hidden parameter, if you like, although generally we have a good idea what it is. So determinism fails, and that allows us to maintain locality and uh, free will. So if we're going to relax something, well, John Bell liked to relax. This is a picture of him doing just that. So let's follow his lead and relax some assumptions. But first, uh, which assumption we're going to relax, I want to, whoops, I want to talk about how, how this is relevant, why it matters, and that's quantum cryptography. So I've just drawn our picture again. We've got the source. We've got Alice making measurements, Bob making measurements. And we'll suppose now in quantum cryptography, we'll consider an ideal example. And um, probably your tutors will go through what you do with the non-ideal case. So we'll assume they share a special entangled state, a signet state, 
of two polarized photons uh, each time they run the experiment. And uh, and if, it doesn't matter if you don't know what a singlet state is, you only need to know a couple of properties for the purposes of this talk, which I'll tell you. They, they uh, choose to make measurements in certain directions. So they've got polarizers, say, they set them at various different angles that they've pre-chosen, they just choose them at random. Now, the interesting property of the singlet state is if they actually measure their, uh, set their angle, polarize at the same angle, say both vertical, then measure on a singlet state, then whenever Alice gets a plus one, the pho her photon goes through the polarizer, Bob gets a minus one, her photon won't get through. Or if, if it doesn't go through Alice's, it will go through Bob's. And it doesn't matter what angle they set it, their polarizers at, if they set them at the same angle, voila, they get this perfect anti-correlation between their results. And so that's good because after they've done the experiments, uh, they know their results. And, and if they tell each other, if they communicate over the telephone line and says, well, I was measuring this angle on this run and then this angle and so on, they can look through and compare and say, hey, we were measuring the same angle on certain runs. And so for those runs, uh, we know what the results are and we know what you've got. And so they say we can generate a cryptographic key, a sequence, a string of zeros and ones to use as a cryptographic key. And so they had the same angle on this particular run. Alice got a plus, so Bob had to have got a minus. They agree whenever Alice gets a plus, Bob gets a minus, the key is zero. And they don't have to communicate what their results were. They might have got a minus and a plus when they had that same angle, in which case their key digit, they agree that'll be a one. Here they got a minus plus when they had the same angles. That's the next key bit and the next key bit. So they can establish a key this way. And what they can do, what happens if they haven't measured the same angles? Well, they can, sh they can uh, share their results for a, subset for, that, for a subset of that case and see whether or not the spell inequality I mentioned before, for example, is violated. If S is bigger than two, and let's suppose that it is, they get something higher. What can they do? They've established a code, but if they believe or make the assumption that physics is local, that even if there are hidden variables, nothing is happening faster than the speed of light at a hidden level. And if they believe they've essentially got free will, they're choosing which measurements to make each of them perfectly randomly, uh, not correlated with anything from the source that helps determine the outcomes. So we assume that measurement independence. If they make those assumptions and they've violated uh, this spell inequality, then we know there cannot uh, be a deterministic explanation of what they're seeing. And what that means in practice, if there's another observer, Eve, somewhere here, perhaps Eve tries to intercept the photons, makes measurements on them, sends them on after doing something disreputable to them, gets information. Uh, she can't get information about the key. And, and the reason is if she did, she'd have a list of, uh, of the outcomes uh, before, before, they, before Alice and Bob knew them. And so if, and if that was the case, that's equivalent to saying the outcomes are predetermined. Eve knows them. So if, it, if it, so, Alice and Bob say, well, determinism fails. There can be no such list held by an eavesdropper anywhere. The key is guaranteed to be secure. And so that's the wonderful, that's one way in which uh, quantum mechanics can be used as a resource. So uh, let's put that into context. Are those assumptions that they make good assumptions? it's probably reasonable to assume that an eavesdropper hasn't got access to faster than light signaling. To do that, you might have to build a wormhole. Uh, we don't think anyone's got that technology. It's probably a safe assumption to make. But there is this free will assumption, and that turns out to be important in practice when you buy your cryptographic apparatus off the shelf. So, and this is what happened to Alice, actually. This little story, Alice met a lady called Eve, who runs a little company called Trust Me, Quantum Security Limited, and she got this really good deal. Eve was selling a quantum cryptography apparatus and it has a source uh, that generates pairs uh, of systems. It's got two key generation devices and, and, and Eve threw in a complimentary bowl of fruit. It was a special offer. And so how does the apparatus work? Well, it runs automatically. It uses random number generators to let those measurement settings, X and Y. And why is that? It's because if you 
if you decided to use your own free will, or Alice and Bob did, to select the settings, they might generate a, a setting freely about one per second. If you want to set up a good cryptographic code and use it for modern communications, you need a <laughs> you need a gigabyte of key per second, something like that, really, to be practical. So you use fast random number generators. Okay. And then and Eve says, well, that, that's random, so it's still not correlated with anything the source produces, the operation of those generators. Uh, you get the results and uh, you get a guaranteed key out of it. And so Alice and Bob say, well, let's test this device. And they, 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 they're they satisfied there's nothing going on faster than light. Either they believe Eve doesn't have the technology, uh, they, they do the experiments with their two random number generators and measurement systems separated by spaceflight separation. They test the performance of the random number generators, run them past all the randomness tests they can think of, and, and with the behaviour of the source, they can't find anything. They, they treat, seem to be truly random numbers to the best of their ability. Wow, they say, she must, they must be using a quantum random number generator here. Who knows? And they find that a bell inequality is violated. And here's where it's a real bargain. They, they, they find it's violated with a value of S very close to 2 root 2. Very good. So they, they can set up this, this, this quantum code very quickly and, and they conclude they've got a bargain. But should Alice have trusted Eve? That's the question. And to, uh, to help give uh, a hint as to what the answer is, here's Alice. Here's Eve, is the bowl of fruit or an element thereof. Okay, so the answer is pretty clear No, That's what I'm saying. She shouldn't trust Eve. That's the same if you want to buy your cryptographic apparatus from, from some government organisation. Well, maybe maybe you should think carefully whether you want to do that. So, uh, well, I'm sorry, there's something come up here, but hopefully it will go away. So, Eve desired designs the apparatus, or she's designed it such that each random number generator, in fact, isn't independent of the operation of the source. Uh, it's influenced. It turns out very subtly, uh, almost impossible to detect by the source, so she can build it that way. And each measurement, Alice and Bob, when they run the randomness test, they just see 50-50 outcomes. Alice's apparatus chooses between two outcomes. Bob's apparatus chooses with, with equal probabilities. Passes all the tests. The bell inequality is violated by two root two or whatever amount Eve sets it to. And uh, and as I said here, the influence on the random number generators on their opera operation it isn't observable unless you know what lander is, how lander is encoded. Eve knows. Eve knows every what's going to happen on every run of this device. But even if you know lander, lander. She set up the apparatus such that there's only a very slight nudge given to perfectly random probabilities. It's not very, it's not very strong influence. So, uh, and I'll explain what I mean by that a little later. And so the moral here, the practical takeaway thing is if, if you do buy an off-the-shelf quantum cryptography apparatus, you don't necessarily trust the manufacturer, uh, ask the manufacturer to allow you to plug in your own random number generators or run it very slowly and use your own free will, if you think you have free will. Okay. Uh, I, I wish I could make this go away. All right, well, I'm, I apologise for the thing up the top. Uh, what it says is, what is the most efficient way for Eve to build this device? Or a more fundamental question uh, for, for uh, nature, if nature might actually work this way, that uh, you have what you think are random number generators or human beings with free will making measurement choices independently of everything else in the universe, maybe that's not such a reasonable system. Perhaps all physical systems affect other physical systems and there are always slight correlations around. So we could ask even if uh, perhaps, perhaps nature acts this way as well. There are correlations between everything, including sources, and the devices, the physical devices that select measurements. Okay, so when we ask for the most efficient way to do something, uh, we have to we have to have a measure of efficiency. And so we're going to use information. We're living in an information age. So uh, 
certainly if, if measurement independence hold, held, there, um, there'd be no correlation. You can't violate a Bell inequality this way. So we assume now that there's some correlation between the choice of measurement settings and the underlying variable. If you want to, if you want to quantify the, the amount of correlation, you can use what's called the Shannon mutual information uh, put forward by Shannon, Claude Shannon in 1949. And it's very important in both classical and quantum information theory. And uh, if you have two random variables in general, let's call one capital M, the other capital N, they'll, have a, they'll share a mutual information between them. And uh, these two random variables will have some joint probability distribution, P, M, N. And this is from that joint distribution. You can work out the marginal distribution for M, the marginal distribution for N, and you form this quantity. It's called the Shannon Mutual Information. Uh, one, when Shannon was thinking about this definition, he was thinking of M as the distribution of inputs into the transmitter of a communication channel. And he was thinking of N as the distribution of outputs coming out for each input uh, of that communication channel, the outputs from the receiver. So naturally, in a communication channel, you want the inputs and the outputs to be highly correlated. You want them to carry a lot of information. And uh, so that's, but you can use this definition of mutual information to define a correlation between any random variables you like. And it has some very natural properties. Uh, you can show it's not got an operational interpretation. It's the amount of error-free data that you gain measured in bits. That's what the log two is here for, which you gain about six, uh, per value of M uh, in a long sequence of outputs about the corresponding values of N. And it's symmetric. It doesn't matter which way you talk about it. It's a symmetric quantity. It's also the amount of error-free data gained about the values of N, uh, so about the values of M, given the values of N. And, and naturally, as one would expect, if, if your probabilities factorise, then uh, you get log of one, which vanishes. There's no information if they're uncorrelated. So if we want to measure, if we want to minimise measurement independence, have the most efficient model in that sense, we want to minimise the correlation between the choices of measurement settings. I've used capital letters to name the random variables, little x and little y are just particular values. We want to minimise the correlation between those and, and this uh, hidden variable. So how do we do that? And how can I get rid of this? Okay. All right. Uh, okay. So we can ask the question now again, for some observed degree of Bell non-locality, so we've got some value of S bigger than two that we've measured, what's the least amount of mutual information, the least amount of correlation we need to have a deterministic and local model? So we're going to explain Bell inequalities with determinism, uh, with nothing happening faster than the speed of light. So we still have Bell non-locality, S is greater than two, but there's nothing, well, there doesn't appear to be anything actually non-local going on at all. This is why it used to be called, and some people still talk about quantum lo non-locality as if quantum mechanics is truly non-local. Uh, that's actually not necessarily the case. I'll just make that point. And so now people are careful, or much more careful, to use the term Bell non-locality. It's a particular sort of non-locality. And it can be perfectly local in a you know, usual classical sense. Okay, so what's this graph here show? You can ignore most of it. Just concentrate on this purple curve at the bottom. Okay, what does the graph show? It plots the value of S that you might specify. We're only interested in values of S that are larger than two. Uh, in quantum mechanics, they can only run up to this two root two value. But uh, in fact, outside quantum mechanics, you could have values of S running up to four in principle. So you may as well ask how much information do I need to, to give super quantum correlations, anything past this point. On this axis is the amount, it's that, uh, it's that value of mutual information, the amount of correlation you need, the amount of measurement dependence that you need or loss of free will. So, if we have a look to, to produce the value of S equals 2 root 2, you need a fairly small amount. There's one bit right at the top, 
You only need a fraction of that. Uh, if, if, Eve is, if you have the most efficient model possible, you only need a 22nd of a bit of mutual information. So that's, that's very subtle. And that's what I meant by subtle. If, if Eve can build an apparatus like this, uh, you're hiding that information in a very small way. I could talk more about that perhaps if there are questions later about that. Okay. And also, not only that, Eve gets, uh, we've, we've got the promise of a model that is very simple. It turns out to only require four different hidden variable values. So we're not saying that lambda has to be an angle or angle, uh, something continuous. And it only, in fact, only has to have four different values. And I mentioned down the bottom, uh, we published this result in uh, Physical Review A last year. Okay, this is a slide that just shows what the optimal model looks like. And uh, here it is, I'm sorry. So um, we don't have to worry too much about the details. I wanted to give you an idea of how simple the model is, but I'll explain briefly what appears in this table. First, lambda has four different values. We could have labelled them one, two, three, four, but I've labelled them using binary notation. Uh, that's Cyril Bronsiart. He loves binary notation. Uh, the probability of having on any run a particular value of lambda, one of these four values, is a quarter. They're just a uniform distribution. The probability that Alice chooses setting X and Bob chooses setting Y for a given value of lambda is, is in these tables. So the probability that choose X equals zero and Y equals zero for this first value of lambda is one minus P over three, and P is just a number between zero and a half. If they instead choose this setting, well, same probability uh, of choosing this setting, given lambda, same probability of choosing that setting, but there's a difference. So we can see there's a correlation built in, and we see that it's different for different lambda. So we, we can see there's a correlation. Okay, uh, this part of the table is just telling us, this says if Alice chooses X equals zero, what's her measurement result? It's S. And uh, Eve can set S to be plus or minus one, whatever she wants. S, T, U and V are just numbers you choose for your model that either they can be all plus one, they can be a mixture of plus ones and minus ones. Similarly, Bob, if he chooses Y equals zero, he, he gets the result S here but he gets the result T here and so on. Okay. And to get our model that produces a bell, oh, and I will point out that you'll note that Alice's measurement result depends on lambda, depends on whether she chooses X equals zero or, S, or X equals one. It doesn't depend on Bob's model. So it's, it's perfectly local. There's nothing faster than light in this model. And uh, it's also deterministic by construction. And yet uh, it gives a value of that uh, Bell inequality violation, you get a value of two root two, if you choose P to be about 0.15, so about a six. Okay. But it turns out there's a causality surprise, uh, which is that the uh, this model that gives you such the most efficient model, it doesn't consider how we've transmitted the information that's shared between the source and the, um, the random number generators, if you like, these inputs. Uh, and there's many possibilities, and it turns out that it's actually very important to consider that, which came as a surprise, which is why I've called this a causality surprise. Um, so to use more convenient diagrams than this, which takes up a lot of room, I want to pack this information into what's called a causal diagram. And uh, basically, if there's a hidden variable like X is taking zero or one, that hidden variable I'll just label by its capital letter. Uh, so this hidden variable, uh, which is Alice's choice of measurement, feeds into the measurement result A, little a, but I'll label the random variable by capital A. And it's influenced by this arrow here coming from whatever that hidden variable is at the source. Uh, and lambda, this hidden variable also determines, it has an input into what the deter, what the outcome is. In our case, it actually determines it 100%. And, uh, and lambda similarly influences Bob's choice of input and it influences the outcome of the measurement. So this sort of causal diagram, this is, and the, with these arrows is showing what can influence what. 
And certainly if Eve's going to build an apparatus uh, to subvert quantum cryptography and cheat and then sell it on the open market, this is the sort of causal diagram she wants to draw. But there are other possibilities which would be much more difficult for Eve to work with. Uh, for example, suppose your source influences the outcome, sure. And, and of course, the choice of measurement in setting in, helps influence the outcomes. But suppose the uh, measurement setting influences the hidden variable. So we draw arrows like that. That We'd have a retrocausal form of measurement dependence, which uh, would be hard for Eve. She'd need physical influences set up to travel backwards in time. Okay. But, and yet in both cases, there's a correlation between the hidden variable source and these random number generators. Both cases, there's a correlation. So we, but uh, one's physical and one's not physical. Another possibility, the last one I'll mention for now on this slide, <laughs> is one sided here. There's no influence, uh, no correlation between uh, the source and uh, Bob's choice of setting completely free. However, there is between uh, Alice's choice of measurement and the source. And perhaps that influence goes this way or this way. So there's one-sided causal. The influence goes from land source to device. Uh, ret one-sided retrocausal would be the other way. And what's important, we can now go back to our model and ask, well, what's it? It, it looks, we've specified a probability distribution. I showed it to you in the table before. Uh, is that causal or retrocausal? You can't tell, can you? <laughs> and what's interesting, it turns out to be retrocausal. There's no way to implement that model except retrocausally. And, and so this was the surprise. We'd found the most efficient model. It had been conjectured to be the most efficient model in 2019, and it's related to an earlier model for the entire, all me possible measurements you can make on a quantum singlet state in 2010, I was involved in both these pieces of work. We thought all these models were causal, but it turns out you can't. You can only implement them retrocausally. So this promise, Eve can't build this system unless she knows how to make it. influences go backwards in time. Perhaps nature can build something like this. Perhaps this is how things could work in nature, but that's certainly beyond our control. I'll talk a little bit more about that later. Okay, so what's the best causal model, I hear you ask? This is what Eve wants to know for sure. Otherwise, how's she going to cheat the quantum cryptography? And so this is the same diagram as before. We're plotting the values of S, possible values that we might want to simulate, the amount of information required. But now this blue-orange curve tells us if we want our model to be causal, then this is the amount, minimum amount of information we need, a point on this curve for a given value of S. And you can see that if you make things perfectly causal, you need roughly twice the amount of information. The reason this curve has two colours uh, is it turns out it's mathematically it's difficult. Uh, the variational problem isn't pretty and, and you have to do a bit of work. Um, okay. And so actually for Eve to build a practical device, how much causal information she needs, and, you know, we were, we were interested in this research. Maybe she's going to need half a half a bit or a full bit, maybe it'll be very obvious what Eve's up to. But luckily, she still only needs a twelfth of a bit of, inf of correlation, causal correlation now, where the influences travel from the source and influence, nudge that those random number generators. So that's still very small and easily hidden. And the model looks very much the same as the previous model in the sense you only need four hidden variables, there's a free parameter P, and so on. So Eve can set this up. So practically, this can be built. I don't think anyone's actually built it, but it's not hard. And, and all Eve has to do is, is code the information in whatever comes from the source. She can tell Alice and Bob it's photons. She can have things that look like lasers and flashing lights and polarizers. But as long as she's sending that, uh, this information uh, to, uh, to Alice and Bob's apparatus, uh, she's right. She knows all the measurement results, she can break the code. Okay, let's, let's not worry about Eve now. Oh, oh I'm just put, oh, sorry. The rest of this curve, this um, yellow greeny line is what happens if you have one-sided uh, measurement dependence. So Bob's system, for example, his choice of measurement is completely free. 
but Alice's isn't. In that case, you need a little bit more information to uh, violate the Bell inequality to a given degree. So we have this general for a given value of S. If you have retrocausal resources, that's the least amount of information. Causal resources, uh, you need a bit more. A one-sided resource, then uh, that's, that's the most out of those three possibilities. But there's other possibilities you can also consider, and I'm not going to say much about them, um, just a little on each. And we also consider them in our paper. One is zigzag measurement dependence. Uh, the, Alice's choice of setting retrocausally influences the hidden, the source, and the source influences Bob's choice of setting, his random number generator. But what's interesting about this, it turns out when you do the maths, to implement this needs exactly the same amount of correlation between lambda and the measurement settings as you do for a causal model, if you just reverse this arrow and go that way. So it turns out that this looks, so uh, they're the same thing. And for me, I, I just like this because it's, it reminds me of fine man's uh, zigzag paths uh, and a guy called Costa de Beauregard who tried to explain quantum effects with zigzag causality. In Feynman diagrams, if you want to explain, uh, let's just go back a little, a causally, if you have a source emitting um, an electron and a positron, uh, Causally, so a photon decays, emits an electron and a positron. Causal propagation, very nice. But instead, Feynman says, well, you can consider that actually there's an electron travelling backwards in time here, as your positron, I've done it the wrong way, haven't I? And a, um, an electron travelling causally. And in Feynman diagrams, that's the same thing. And it turns out that zigzag causality is the same as causal causality for the purposes of building devices, the amount of information you need. You could also consider a situation of super determinism where, where um, your hidden variable, your source, completely determines. Once you know what lander is, you know what the setting is going to be in each case. Um, so that's a very strong correlation, super determinism. And it turns out for that, when you run the numbers, the amount of correlation you need to build such a device is two bits. So not very efficient and probably fairly easily detectable by Alice and Bob. They mightn't have to look too hard to find two bits of information travelling about their system. They didn't expect to be there. And then you might also consider, well, what if, um, what if uh, X's system uh, is superluminal? It sends superluminal information and affects Bob's setting in that way. That would be superluminal measurement dependence. It turns out that's a hopeless resource, even if you could build it with a wormhole uh, you can't violate the Bell inequality that way. What you can do is instead, if you allow Alice's measurement choice of setting to affect Bob's output, the statistics of it. Uh, but that's not measurement dependence anymore. That's exactly a superluminal signal of the type we called our locality assumption or our parameter assumption. So sure, you can violate a Bell inequality in this setup, but at the Eve can't build it. You've still got something going faster than my. Uh, I'm only interested, so I'm not, we don't think Eve can do that. So we're only interested in violating measurement dependence and having a correlations between lambda and, and the settings. Okay. And you could find that the amount of information you need, retrocausal does best, then causal, that's the same as a zigzag, uh, that's less than one sided, and that's less than super deterministic. So retrocausality wins out, always. Okay, so I'm coming to the end in, in quite good time. Uh, I hope <laughs> this talk's still going out live. Nothing's happened in the meantime. So here's the conclusion page. It'll take me a little while to get through. And then we can go on to questions. So uh, off-the-shelf quantum cryptography apparatus, uh, Beware of, of a good deal. Okay, that's good general advice. So if you're if you're offered one at a good price, make sure you can plug in your own random number generators or use your own free will to make those measurement decisions. Then you can be pretty sure that the code that's being the cryptographic key that is being set up is perfectly secure. You only have to additionally believe that there's nothing superluminal going on. Second thing is that causality is important uh, when you're doing some of these information calculations. And there's a whole 
field now at the moment in, in quantum information with quantum causality, uh, quantum causal diagrams and so on. And no doubt some of you have been working with those. And I'm sure some of the speakers will be will be using those, similar to the diagrams I show. Okay. So, and it turns out that causality matters. Uh, if, if you don't have retrocausal abilities, and I don't expect we're likely to, uh, then you've got to spend more information. You need a twelfth of a bit of correlation instead of a twenty-second of a bit, roughly double, uh, to get maximum quantum violation. Now, what about nature? As I said, I've motivated this with Eve trying to cheat on quantum cryptography. But uh, what if nature works that way? And it's something that's just fun to consider. So nature, let's suppose nature should be local, um, nothing faster than the speed of light whizzing around. It should be deterministic. Um, there's various arguments for why you'd like things to be deterministic if you had enough information available. But you also want nature to be maximally efficient. So, yeah, in that sense, as simple as possible, in the sense of efficiency or minimum in information transfer, then it, then uh, nature should work retrocausally. There should be some information whizzing around backwards in time as well as forwards in time. And that way, nature is local, deterministic, and uh, and uh, as efficient as possible. Of course, that raises the can of worms. <laughs> ah, I'm not sure what that noise was. Um, but uh, it, uh, yeah, so any sort of retrocausality like that in nature, it would have to be, in some sense, uncontrollable. Otherwise, there's the grandfather paradox, for example, where you go back and uh, somehow you, and as a result of that, your, your grandfather dies before you're born. Uh, so, um, but 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 that that's just part of the causality surprise of this work. And there are philosophers, particularly not so many physicists, who take retrocausality as a very serious possibility, just like other physicists take faster than light effects as a serious possibility. Uh, one of them's Hugh Price at Oxford. Okay. The other thing is that uh, it's surprising how little correlation you need between the uh, the random number generators that choose measurement settings and your, and your source, uh, a twelfth of a bit to get the full maximum quantum violation. Now, what if instead you allowed superluminal signaling uh, from Alice's uh, measurement device to, to Bob's. It turns out you need a lot more than a twelfth of a bit. You need just about a full bit of information being transferred. Uh, and it's nice you can measure the amount of signalling in terms of bits as well as this, um, the amount of measurement dependence. And uh, if instead you say, well, we'll just use quantum mechanics, in quantum mechanics the resource is the amount of randomness that has to be generated correlated randomness at each of Alice and Bob's side uh, in some magical way, you need a full bit of randomness generation in that case to explain this maximal correlation. So, so you get more bang for your bit is the way I've put that. So that's interesting. It is efficient. And one of the outstanding questions that's still to be asked is uh, if you want to – if you want to – at the moment, in the talk, I've basically talked about simulating a particular scenario where Alice and Bob each make one of two measurements on, say, a singlet state of two qubits and find the value two root two. How can you simulate that? More generally, you'd like to simulate any possible measurement you might like to make on a singlet state. Uh, so polarizations in all directions, including circular polarizations how much information you need to do that. So retrocausally, um, there's a model that I mentioned before from 2010. It requires about a 15th of a bit of correlation, but that's retrocausal. That's no good. What's the best causal model? The best causal model we know at the moment is comes back to a model by de Gore et al. It requires nearly a third of a bit, well, about a quarter of a bit, I guess more accurately, of, of information travelling forward in time, but it's a one-sided model. There's only correlation between um, the source and one of the measurement apparatuses. 
bits. And you can explain all, all singlet state measurements with this, this small number of bits. So the question is whether there's a better causal model that isn't one side that's completely unknown. And I'll stop the talk there and I'll stop sharing for now. Thank you. Is a lock there? <laughs> yeah. Yep. Okay. Thank you very much for this excellent talk. Yeah. So you have many questions. Uh, I shall read for you. And do you find you you got any questions from your uh, Zoom chat box? No. Yes, there's one. Uh, I I was asked back from setting up the key. Uh, this is from uh, Rama Devi. Okay. And so when you set up the cryptographic key, I said that one of the nice properties of the singlet state is if Alice and Bob measure in the same direction, set their polarizations at the same angle, they get perfectly anti-correlated results. Should I put the slide back up or is that okay Just to talk? Okay. Um, Actually, there are many questions I found because maybe they are not in your chat box, but it's here. So should I read uh, them? One of okay, my, my very own. quick yeah. answer to that question. Uh, Rama asked, what if there's a plus a plus plus result? Alice gets a plus result, Bob gets a plus result. For the singlet state, that can't happen if they measure in the same directions. And they only use, they only compare their results to set up the key when they have chosen the same directions. They ask each other what direction they chose. So a plus plus or a minus minus never happens. Okay. Uh, more questions then, Ayla? <laughs> yeah, there's a question from Faria Iqbal. He's asking that if, sorry, the causal model are just theoretical models or are being practically implemented. And also she commented that I am starting now, studying quantum computation first time. I have no previous knowledge. Okay. Oh, good on you for getting into studying quantum computing. These, these models, they're purely in principle. So they can be built. Uh, it would take very little engineering to build a model like this. The hardest thing to do is to make sure you the information that one of those four hidden variables that I showed in the table is coded in a nice non-obvious way. Um, for example, when you transmit photons, you transmit them as part of a mode and that there can be orbital angular momentum information, for example, that is transmitted. You could code the lander in the value of the orbital angular momentum, for example. And there are other subtle ways of doing that. So that's the only engineering challenge, how to hide from Alice and Bob that this very, this, this very small amount of correlation being generated. And uh, good luck with your studies. So one question from Ajay Semwal. How can we create random number generators? Even if, if we get a function or missing, it cannot be random by definition of random. Oh, oh, so I, could, I didn't quite catch all the question, Alok. Yeah, and the question is that how can we create random number generator? Oh, in practice. Yes, in practice. Yes, that's, that's, a, that's a very good point. So, uh, it, of course, some people use what they call quantum random number generators where they uh, measure, where they use something like the vacuum fluctuations, for example, of an optical mode and make a homodyne measurement. And if they get a negative or a positive value, that's a zero or a one. But you're quite right. How do we know that they're, they're, they are truly random numbers? So this is a question we can't answer uh, very easily at all. We can only run what have been recognized as good randomness tests and hope that our our, th our machine passes them. So in practice, we normally generate pseudo-random numbers. In, in the Bell inequality tests that I measured, where they show that this value of S can be greater than two, and they try and get rid of all loopholes. So they wanted very much to have genuine random numbers. One mechanism that one group used was to look at science fiction movies and to take some, which are, which are digital, stored digitally, and they just sample that the, the digits, uh, say the color pixels. And if the pixels bright or low, they assign a plus or a zero. And they assume that whatever's creating your source, a laser, 
kind of known that you were going to use these digits from um, <laughs> from various science fiction movies. Another example is people have done experiments using light from quasars, so light that was created um, millions of years ago and has, have travelled to Earth. So they say, how can that possibly be correlated with our source? So, yeah, there's, there's not a great answer to your question. Uh, in a sense, it's a leap of faith to say randomness is going on. And perhaps free will is, is would be a source of randomness if it exists. Okay. okay. There's a question from Asutosh Rai. Asutosh, do you want to ask uh, here in Zoom? Asutosh? Ah, yes. Uh, no, there's, uh, Asutosh, you are, are you there? Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Can you ask uh, uh, directly? Uh, yeah, uh, okay. So, can can you hear me? Yeah, so my question is that uh, uh, why the hidden variable lambda cannot change uh, after making the uh, measurement choice, particularly because now the lambda state is in the same place where measurement is done. So if we consider this, can we consider retroal causal model also as causal? Uh, well, yes, I, I think I would say yes. Um, we're interested, if we're building a device, then, then there's a value of lambda emitted at the source. And certainly it, it, can, it can be influenced uh, or interact with the choice of measurement set, setting, the random number generator, but it's the combination of what was input, the original lander, and and the measurement choice that choose our measurement setting. So even if they interact and change after that, what are, we're asking of a deterministic model is that uh, lander was known at the source, and that that value of lander even if it changes later on in some fashion, it still determines the source. I'm not sure if that answers your question. Are you, I see you're asking whether a retrocausal model could be regarded as causal in some way. Hmm. Yeah, um, okay. I can't see how. I guess, I guess if you want to send me in an email the sort of causal diagram you have in mind, then uh, we could probably discuss that clearly. But it's a little uh -huh. hard. Okay. okay, thanks, thanks. And uh, may I ask one more question? So, yes. so, sure. so in, in your papers, I have been also uh, studying about there is another assumption which sometimes goes by name outcome independence. Correct. So, yeah, so can you please well, little bit like that. explain uh, these things? Sure. So I made an assumption of determinism, and I mainly made that assumption that the outcomes are predetermined because that's what Eve needs to cheat at quantum cryptography. Uh, she wants to know the results. Um, but there is a weaker assumption you could make and instead of determinism, and there may be reason, one reason you may want to make that assumption, say let's not assume that nature is deterministic, but we'll suppose it satisfies this weaker property called outcome independence, which is essentially that probabilities factorise. If you know lambda, then the probability of outcomes of A and B factorise that joint probability. Um, so while you, you can consider that, and it's of interest to do so, it's only weaker. It's only a weaker assumption in name. If you have if you give me any model that you build that satisfies outcome independence, and maybe it does or doesn't satisfy locality, maybe it does or doesn't satisfy free will, uh, I can build a second model or write down another one which not only satisfies outcome independence but determinism. Uh, so if you if you say I'm only going to make a weak assumption that there's only a, a model, my model only satisfies outcome determinism, I can say, well, that already means there's a model that satisfies determinism. So I, I don't really gain very much by restricting to outcome dependence. The only way that you would gain is in this philosophical question, maybe nature satisfies the weaker assumption, outcome independence. 
it therefore it could satisfy determinism because I can write down a model straight away, which does and reproduces all the same results. But uh, for some reason, nature isn't deterministic. It only satisfies it. So in a sense, there's not a lot gained by relaxing to outcome determinism. Uh, keep a, there's a paper I put on the web last year, which is about, it's largely about outcome dependence and the EPR <coughs> paradox. Mm. If you have a look for that on the web, yeah, it does indicate so, uh, there is something interesting about outcome independence that I don't really have time to get into, but I had to work more on that on that work. And I'd be happy to discuss that over email too, if you like. So can I ask one last question? So okay, that's all last one, yeah. Okay, just a very short one. Okay, uh, there are many. Actually, yeah, actually in, in the assumptions going into okay. derivation of uh, Bell inequalities, uh, <clears throat> like uh, determinism and uh, uh, parameter independence and measurement independence. So uh, the, what uh, what your model suggests is in some sense, like when we when we do the derivation, we start with, then we take all these assumptions on an equal footing. So mm -hmm. we consider that they are all like equally uh, on the, all the assumptions are on equal footing. But your result from measure independence, it shows that in some sense, like they are not, uh, like uh, they are not on the equal footing. Uh, yes. Because yes. when we go to construct the model or simul model, then uh, in, uh, when we relax parameter independence, we need uh, more bits uh, rather yes. when we relax measurement independence. So yes, can I totally agree? I totally so agree. Can, can we uh, make some like uh, uh, some physical statement from this, like uh, maybe like uh, uh, in a, in a, like some of the assumption is more uh, robust uh, or something like this? Uh, I think I think that would be very interesting to look for. You have to remember that I was considering a very simple scenario, trying to explain. Uh, a particular Bell inequality. So you would have to see whether that ordering, that, that massive difference between one bit, say, and, and a 22nd of a bit, holds up as you make the quantum system you're trying to simulate more and more complex. Uh, and perhaps you'll find that, that the two numbers come closer together and there isn't that degree of difference anymore. But you're quite right. It's, a, it's an interesting point that you make and uh, it would be interesting to investigate what happens uh, more generally. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Professor Hopf. Uh, thank you for the oh, talk. It was really nice yeah. to see you. Yeah. <clears throat> so there's a, one more question from Narasimha. Does lack of measurements independence has any restriction on space-time structure? Uh, well, in a sense, yes, uh, because as uh, oh, well, no, sorry, let me let me rephrase that as no. Um, when we're, we're simply assuming, I guess we we're assuming something about our space time that um, certainly that there are time like paths, and so if we have a causal measurement dependent model, that one twelfth of a bit model, everything propagates along time like trajectories. Uh, it would be interesting, perhaps you're thinking about the possibility, are there causal loops, for example? Um, but a retrocausal model would have to assume that some information can propagate backwards in time. That's allowed in some physical models, uh, although it appears to generate paradoxes, even in classical electromagnetic theory. But... Uh, but so I guess I'm assuming a fairly standard space time. If one allows wormholes, then that probably has more implications for the locality assumption, parameter independence. Because if we had wormholes available to change our structure of space time isn't what we normally think of as at the macroscopic level, then um, sure, it would be fine to consider violations of, of locality. But for measurement independence, I guess I haven't thought 
any further than uh, you can do causal models in a perfectly normal looking space time. You don't need anything exotic. And I don't think any other special assumptions are made. Um, yeah, I'll, uh, I'll leave the answer there, I think. I hope it helps. The questions from Maitri Sarkar. <clears throat> How do you design the causality, retrocausality factors in experimental settings? I mean, the by factors, you mean something, something different. But uh, let me repeat the question. How do you design causality and retrocausality factors in experimental settings? Okay, so in the experimental setting, you can't design retrocausality in. So that just turns out to come out of the mathematics if you're not careful to put in the requirement that you want any causal information flow, you can generate correlations which can only be implemented retrocausality, retrocausally. And we don't know how to do that. But we do know how to implement causal things. So if you remember the causal diagrams I showed, uh, one way would be to do it openly. You, you build a little device and inside your source, there's, there's two little men. And when you push the button, the two little men climb out of their device. They walk over to the random number generators and they write something on the random number generator. That's just the value <laughs> of the hidden variable, one, two, three, or four. Uh, or they push a button on the random, a little hidden button on random number generators, the one, two, three, four button. Now the random number generator knows uh, how to choose the measurement settings with what probability distribution correlated to which button the little men have pushed. The little men go on to the output apparatus and, and push the same little hidden button. So that's a very silly way to generate physically a device that's perfectly causal. And when you look at the measurement statistics that's been implemented. In practice, of course, you'd have something like a light signal of some sort, maybe at a frequency you're not looking for, is sent from the source to the random number generators and the measurement apparatus. They detect that measurement source and they read off a signal. The signal is just lambda equals one, lambda equals two, lambda equals three, or lambda equals four. They take that as an input into the way they work We've just got a little computer chip in those devices. The random number generators then take that input and say, here's the, here, I've chosen this setting this time. They know what probability distribution to choose the setting from. And of course, the output of the measurement then uh, is, is determined by, by that setting and by the value that's been beamed to them. So that's, that's a very simple way that is probably easily detectable, but that's how you can build such a device in practice, which I think is what you're getting at in your question. I can't tell you how to build a retrocausal device. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> I, I try to have a very open mind in physics generally and not to believe things, um, not to take too strong a position on anything. So I'm open to retrocausality and I find it interesting, but I think it's probably unlikely. So as a research topic, it's one of those things that you should probably do on the side rather than make your main <laughs> element of research because you may not get very far other than various negative results. But I do like the fact that out of this paper came a possible argument. Gee, maybe if nature's maximally efficient, maybe there are some retrocausal effects. So at least I'm giving heart to some philosophers. Um, more questions <coughs> from George Johnny. Uh, no, it's from Ayan Kumar Ghosh. He's saying that if a system is deterministic, can we say that the outcomes are correlated? If so, how come the measurement is independent of the outcome? Okay, that's that's a good question. So if you know lambda, then the outcomes are determined, and so. If you have, and there's no probabilities in that sense. Everything happens or doesn't happen uh, as far as the output is concerned of the measurement. However, if you don't know lambda, then lambda we describe statistically by a probability distribution. So again, for each value of lambda, both outcomes are determined uh, deterministically. But once we average over the distribution of possible lambda, suddenly we get a statistical correlation. 
And that's what the experimentalists see. Uh, we often call lambda a hidden variable because we assume for some reason the experimenters don't know about it. It's inaccessible to them. So they can't measure lambda. Okay, so 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 that's that that's the basic idea. It's where it's the normal classical idea of probability. Why do we see probabilities even in a Newtonian world when we flip a coin? It's because we're missing that extra information encoded by some lander that would tell us exactly what the result of each coin toss would be. But unfortunately, uh, we don't know the initial conditions well enough. We assign a 50-50 probability to a fair coin. Okay. We have more. Ah, let's say a question from Ajoy Shemal. What are your thoughts on nature being random? And how free will fits in randomness of nature? Okay. Um, the main, the best possible argument for randomness in nature is quantum mechanics works so well. Uh, the, uh, it explains just about everything we see. Uh, so why add more to it? The, the best argument against randomness used to be classically that we just didn't know enough of what was going on. Randomness is due to ignorance, usually of initial conditions. But quantum mechanics has something very special about it, and that is these perfect correlations of the singlet state. I have the two photons, one going to Alice, one going to Bob. And if Alice and Bob happen to choose the same directions, they know they have to give opposite answers. But how does the photon at Bob know that Alice is going to measure the same direction or not? It seems, if locality holds, that, uh, that um, it must have already decided what answer it was going to give for a given direction. So quantum mechanics itself provides a very strong motivation for saying, um, at least on the face of it, that there, there must be some hidden information. The photons are carrying the answers with them. But uh, that's only one interpretation of quantum mechanics. So where quantum mechanics can win out is by choosing, by choosing the right, quantum, right interpretation of quantum mechanics such that randomness makes sense even for the singlet state correlations. There's two ways to do that. The main way is the so-called many worlds interpretation. If we consider a many world example, one photon goes to Alice, one go to Bob, they've chosen the same directions and yet they both get a plus one result. How is that possible? It, it is possible in many worlds. The results are random, however, after the measurement where they've both got plus one, they can never communicate again, that Alice and that Bob. They've ended up in different worlds. The world is split. So the many worlds interpretation, I think, allows one to consistently maintain this true randomness in nature and quantum mechanics uh, exploits that. Uh, and you still see the perfect correlations whenever Alice and Bob end up in the same universe and can come back and compare the results. If they've measured the same angle, they get the opposite results to each other perfectly. Um, that's not to, that's not an endorsement for many worlds. There's various problems with many worlds interpretation, of course, but it is one very strong, nice feature of many worlds that it can provide a, an explanation of, of Bell non-locality in that sense and maintain randomness. Okay, I hope that's enough. Thank you. An answer. There's, uh, there are many questions, but I will ask maybe the last one. That uh, uh, what is the difference between zigzag super determinism and non locality, and what is the best causal model? And what is the best causal model? Okay, so I guess when I talked about zigzag causality, uh, I'm talking about as it appears in measurement dependence. So as it appears in loss of free will. So I'm trying to explain, I'm trying to generate a correlation between the random number generators and the source. I'm not trying to create a correlation between the output of the measurement results and the source, for example. So you could have different types of zigzag causal dependence in a more general sense. It's a bit like you could have causal, as we as I showed in one of the diagrams, you could have uh, superluminal 
uh, dependence linking the random number generators. That won't help you violate a bell inequality. But if you have a superluminal signal linking a random number generator to the output, the measuring device of the other system, you can violate a bell inequality. Uh, and that's normal, non-locality. But let's go back to zigzag, zigzag measurement dependent causality. So perhaps I should have been more careful in the talk where the, a signal goes retrocausally from one random number generator to the source that influences the source. And then the, a signal from the source travels to the other random number generator and influences it. Then there's no non-locality in the sense I defined it of parameter independence. What I mean by that is the choice Alice's setting does not directly influence, does not directly influence the um the output. There's nothing superluminal going on, except in the sense that, of course, if something goes backwards in time, it's the same particle. It's gone backwards in time and then forwards in time, then uh, you're going to say, wow, it's effectively travelled superluminally. Uh, so there is a distinction there. So I, I, I have to admit that if you have something happening retrocausally in the backwards light cone, which then somehow propagates or influences something to propagate causally in the forward light cone, you effectively have a superluminal effect. But even so, they're not the same. So they're not in relativity. Travelling backwards within the backward light cone is very different to travelling superluminally outside the light cone. Uh, another analogy I'd make there is to consider black hole evaporation. Uh, we normally think of how does a particle get out of black hole across the horizon? We can think of, well, there's a particle created outside the horizon, say it could be light, it, it decays into two electron-positron pair, one falls into the black hole, the other escapes. Great, black hole's evaporating. And they both travel, the electron travels causally and the positron, the antiparticle, travels causally. But instead you could just say, I uh, suppose it's a positron that fell into the black hole. Well, maybe the, that positron's an electron. It actually travelled backwards in time out of the black hole and then forwards in time out of the black hole. Uh, <laughs> so you can, look at, you can look at these things in, in, in different ways. Okay, that probably just confused the issue and I apologise. Uh, <laughs> the answer okay. is it's complicated. And there are a few more questions, but uh, uh, we have to stop somewhere and there are many questions and the thing is that we want to take a, a, a photograph i mean i don't know how to the skin sort or something so professor panik right. told me to uh, switch on all of you the camera so i uh, professor panik can uh, yeah yeah so i'll take it from here just request people to switch show their faces yeah Sutos, so nice to see you <laughs> you are now in korea very good. Yeah, some more, some more faces, some more faces. All our hosts. It's <laughs> time to make a cup of tea. Yeah. <laughs> well, looks like looks like only we are there. So fine, would I'm just taking one. Yeah, done. Done. Okay. Uh, it was nice, and Excellent. thank you very thank much, you very Dr. Much. Hall, for giving this, this very interesting and very exciting lectures. And I think we'll have more questions. People will may, may contact you for some clarification for understanding. And so, thank you well. very much. Very welcome. Professor Panikai? Yeah, Professor Hall, it was really enjoyable. I really enjoyed You know, I am new to this area, you know, this, uh, and I'm really, I thanks to Alok, I'm beginning to learn some aspects of it and the bunker home. Very enjoyable talk. Thank you so much. Uh -huh. Well, thank you. That was a pleasure. Pleasure to be here. Okay. Hope to be involved again. See you. All right. All the best. Yeah. I'll uh, I'll leave and come back at it. I'll, I'll sample this summer school as it goes on. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Bye. Bye. So, look. Uh, next one. Uh -huh. uh, Sorin will introduce. And Debu uh, Kiranji will introduce. We'll come back. Let me say, Kartik, who are you? Kartik Mohan. Go on, Mr. Are you there, Kartik? Yes. Yeah, yeah. You are the one this work with Bruno? 
Uh, yeah, for my masters. Okay, okay. Where are you now? With who? 